How do pilots navigate when flying? Don't they use GPS? Well, how did they navigate before satellites? Or before electronics for that matter? Uh, they use the stars? No. They use aeronautical charts, plotters, and flight computers. Computers? You asked how they navigated before electronics. Ah, yes. I'm not talking about modern computers. I'm talking about mechanical devices that compute. Today, we're going to be talking about how pilots used to navigate before computers. Wait, uh, before electronic computers. And we'll show how pilots still have to demonstrate this skill in order to get their license. But enough talk, more data. It's data time. I'm data. So today, we're going to be talking about how aviators can navigate using only three things. An aeronautical chart, a navigational plotter, and a flight computer. This is the E6B flight computer. It essentially functions like a rotating slide ruler. The E6B has been around for over a hundred years. It was actually the flight computer that was used on Amelia Earhart's final flight before she went missing. That may not be the best testimonial for it. Oh, yeah. On one side of the computer, we have this dial, which sort of looks like a stargate that we use to calculate rates like speed or fuel consumption. We set the dial to our speed, like 120 miles per hour. Then we follow the outer dial to find our distance. Let's say we want to go 60 miles. It would take us 30 minutes to get there. On the other side of the computer, we have our wind calculator, which we'll get to later. Next, we're going to look at our aeronautical chart, which is basically just a big map of different airspaces. We're going to be using the San Francisco sectional map. We are also going to be using our navigational plotter for distance and heading. The plotter is already scaled to measure statute miles on a sectional map. There is also a compass that we will align to the map in order to determine our course. Finally, we have our navigation log to record our findings. Okay, so first we open our sectional aeronautical chart and fold it to expose the portion of the map we want for our trip. For this exercise, let's say we want to start our trip at Livermore Airport and fly all the way over to Mayfair. First, we set the statute side of our plotter to our departure point. Then, we rotate the plotter so that the ruler is aligned with our destination. Then, we can read the distance on the ruler between the two points. Here, we see that the distance is 34 miles, so we record that distance in our navigation log. For the purposes of this example, let's say there is wind coming from a heading of 300 degrees at a speed of 20 miles an hour. Let's also say that we have set our aircraft's airspeed to be 110 miles an hour. I should also mention that we need to draw a line from our source to our destination, which I've already done on this map. Now we need to find our heading using the compass portion of the plotter. Remember, we need to overlay the crosshair over the intersection of the course with the longitudinal line on the map. That way, we can align the northern line to true north. Once we have our plotter aligned correctly, we follow our course line to our destination in order to find our direction on the compass. Here, it looks like we need to fly a true course of 50 degrees. Then, we record that in our navigation log. Now we need to calculate our wind correction using the wind side of our flight computer. First, we dial in the direction that the wind is coming from. In our example, we said that the wind was coming from a direction of 300 degrees. Then, we need to move the velocity slider so that 100 is under the center reticle. We use 100 just as a convenience, since this calculation only requires us to calculate an offset from the center reticle. We said that the wind speed was 20 miles per hour, so we count 20 up from the center reticle and make a mark there. This mark indicates our wind direction and speed. Now we dial in our course of 50 degrees. As we do so, our mark rotates over to the left. Now we adjust the velocity slider so that our mark is aligned with our airspeed. We said that our airspeed was 110 miles an hour, so we set the mark on the 110 line. As you can see, the mark is also on the line indicating a wind correction angle of 10 degrees to the left. We can also see that our reticle is now set at 115 miles an hour, which indicates our ground speed. What this is telling us is that given our wind direction and speed, we have to fly the airplane on a heading that is 10 degrees left of our desired course. This is also telling us that we have a bit of a tailwind, which is pushing us faster than our airspeed. This is the critical difference between course and heading, as well as the difference between airspeed and ground speed. So we record our wind correction angle of 10 degrees left, which gives us a true heading of 40 degrees. How come we keep saying true heading or true course? Is there a false course? Well, it turns out true north refers to the North Pole, where the Earth's axis is. 
However, the magnetic North Pole is actually in Northern Canada. This is probably to get away from Santa's workshop in the North Pole. What are you telling them? Nothing. This is a problem because the compass in our airplane points to the magnetic North Pole and not the true North Pole. But that's okay, because each aeronautical chart publishes its magnetic variance. For our location, the magnetic variance is 15 degrees east. This means that in our navigation log, we have to subtract 15 from our true heading in order to get our magnetic heading. So the magnetic heading we will fly on our compass is 25 degrees. Finally, we record our magnetic deviation, which is the electromagnetic interference that each aircraft has on its own compass. But we don't have time for that, so we'll just mark it as zero. This gives us our compass heading of 25 degrees. Now we record our ground speed, which we calculated as 115 miles per hour. So we use the other side of the flight computer to calculate our ETE, or estimated time en route. Most people would just say ETA, but most people are wrong. So first we set our rate dial to our ground speed, which we said was 115 miles per hour, or 11 and a half on this dial. Then we follow the outer dial to find our distance, which we calculated as being 34 miles. Then we look at the corresponding inner dial to find our time. Looks like it's almost 18 minutes. So we record that ETE in our navigation log. And that's it. We will fly a compass heading of 25 degrees at an airspeed of 110 miles per hour for 18 minutes. And then we should be at our destination. You don't even need to look out the window, but you definitely should.